welcome you all to the closing program for the EPSCOR Summer Research Internship. We've had an enjoyable four weeks. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah. With, your, with your kids here. Um, they've enjoyed themselves. I'm sure they've learned a lot. Um, and you're sure to be impressed by the presentations that they have for you today and the growth that they have had, you know, educational wise and I guess you've kind of seen throughout the weeks um, some of the personal care things that they've been able to manage on their own living in the dormitory without you all all week. So um, you should really be proud of your, um, of your students, of your kids. Um, they've really done a great job. They've um, been a joy to have. So we're going to start with the presentations that's outlined in the program. And um, once, uh, after Dr. Tisdale comes, they will um, get started with the presentations in the EPS school program. Our students are from the state of Georgia and South Carolina that's in the program this year. We have students from several schools within the local area and outside of the area, in, uh, such as Columbia. We thank you for coming to see your students and what they have learned within the last four weeks of being here at Clapham University. It is going to be an amazing experience to see that you can take these students from high school, put them into a research laboratory, and they can carry out a project through the entire scientific process. So give them your undivided attention and know that they might be a little nervous, but they are great. So again, welcome to Clapham University and the high school EPSCOR research program. Good morning, my name is Justin Brown, and I'm a rising junior at Warrensburg Women's High School. And I'm Destiny Bailey, a rising sophomore at Hesper High School. Oh, and our experiment this summer was on the neutralizing ability of antacid tablets. Our experiment was to determine which antacid dissolved the most stomach acid between tongues and generic brain. Digestion in the stomach results from the active gastric fluid. The acidity of the stomach makes inactive forms turn to active forms to dissolve minerals and kill germs that may enter the stomach along with food. Acids are a group of chemicals that are usually in liquid form with a pH lower than 7. Acids are very sour. And uh, the acid we used in our experiment was hydrochloric acid. A base is a solution that has the essence of an OH negative ion. The base that we used for the experiment was sodium hydroxide. Stomach acid is a digestive fluid formed in the stomach and is composed of hydrochloric acid, potassium chloride, and sodium chloride. Some foods and medicines we use on a daily basis that contain acids are eggs, beans, unsweetened yogurt, milk, raw honey, most vegetables, including potatoes, most fruits, herbs, and spices. You can see the materials that we used throughout our research over these past few weeks. The last three that you see there, we used a 0.5 molarity HCl, which is hydrochloric acid, a 1 molarity NaOH, which is sodium hydroxide, and phenophthalein as our indicator during our titration process. So first, a, a tongue tablet was weighed. We put it in a flask. We put it acid. Put it in the flask. As the, as the tablet dissolved, we put the barrette up with sodium hydroxide <coughs> and start titrating it until we reach the ending point. So here we have our observation and calculations chart. For each brand of tablet, we did three trials with three different tablets. We have our mass tablet, because we weighed each tablet, the initial volume, the final volume, the total volume, which is the final minus the initial. And for the moles of acid neutralized, we used the formula that you can see there on the bottom, which is the molarity of NaOH times the volume with NaOH minus the molarity of HCl times the volume of HCl. And we did the same thing for the name brand tablet. So for our result, we found that the most effective antacid tablet was the generic brand of tablet. And we feel that the reason behind that is because the generic tablet has 200 milligrams more calcium than the name brand tablet. So, uh, we would like to thank Dr. Peters, Dean Tisdale, our mentor, Mrs. Bradley, 
Ms. Cherry, our counselors, Edwin and Kiana, Takiya McClary, the Escort Program, and Classroom University. Well, more calcium, more stomach acid neutralized. And there was more calcium in the engineering room. Yes, ma'am. Yes. Based to what their um, to their energetic what your biggest suggestion to them in reading labels? Calcium carbonate is in the tablet, and look for the amount of calcium that's in the tablet. Yes. What's the and name brand. Uh, name is there any difference or uh, Any other questions? Good morning. My name is Jasmine Evans. I'm a rising sophomore from Orangeburg Richardson High School. Good morning. My name is Arrington Davis. I'm a rising senior at Bristol North East High School. And our research topic was on an antimicrobial activity of mint leaf extraction on gram positive bacteria. Streptococcus epidermidis and Mycococcus fluidus, and also our antibiotics. So, mint has four species, Japanese mint, peppermint, spearmint, and bergamot mint, but the mint that we will be talking about is minta pepperita, also known as peppermint. So when we think of mint, we also know, we know it for the refreshing application, but mint is far more powerful and enhancing than one thinks. It's used to promote digestion, to relieve headaches, for respiratory disorder, for skin care, etc., etc. So our project was revolved on how this small thing that's so powerful, which is a natural healer, can get rid of this bacteria. The difference between gram-positive bacteria and gram-negative bacteria, so you can see right there, gram-positive has a thicker layer of peptidoglycan, while gram-negative only has one layer of peptidoglycan. So while when we do the gram-staining process, then gram-positive will retain the crystal violet color that is given while when we're doing the decolorization process, gram negative will be washed away and it will leave, it will be left with this pink color right here, while gram positive will be left with this purple color right here. Uh, Staphylococcus epidermidis is found in all healthy places in human skin and mucosal surfaces. Uh, it does not cause any diseases, but it will remain a relationship with this host. And Micrococcus gluteus is found in soil, dust, water, and air. And it also stays on mammal skin. It can cause septic shock, pneumonia, UTI, or a person with a low, uh, low immune system. So our research serves as a representation how the mint leaf extract can um, provide a natural elimination of the ground positive bacteria. We believe that if we perform the water treatment method using distilled water and the ethanol extraction method on the mint leaves, that it will be fully capable of fighting off this gram positive bacteria. We pr predicted that if we did the ethanol method, that it provide a larger zone of inhibition. So some of the materials and methods that we used was the microbiology methods, which includes the sterile technique, making of the media, and pouring of the culture plates. We also used two extraction methods, which is the ETOH, the ethanol mint extraction, and the water treatment method. And we also used the disc diffusion assay, which is used for the antibacterial sensitivity testing. Um, and more, our materials and methods. We used our sterile technique, where we disinfect the lab with 70% ethanol. We used our media preparation, where we accurately weighed 10 grams of LB and dry media. We did our media sterilization where we sterilized our media in an olive plate. We did our plate pouring where we performed media plate pouring by pouring the media into a petri dish with over an open flame to reduce contamination. And we did our streaking technique where we pick a single colony from each gram positive bacteria using a streaking method to isolate our own bacteria in our petri dish. And what we do is we get, uh, use a loop and sterilize the loop in an open flame and then we get an isolated colony from a petri dish that already contains bacteria in it and transfer it over to our petri dish that we made with our media guard and streak it on and 
a zigzag way right there, get 30% of the plate, then you turn the plate 90 degrees, sterilize the loop in an open flame right there, and then you streak it again in a zigzag line, sterilize the loop one more time, turn the plate in another 90 degree angle, um, zigzag it on, sterilize the loop one more time, and put it in an incubator for 37 degrees Celsius overnight. <coughs> So this is one of the methods that we use, which is the ETOH extraction method, the ethanol extraction method. First, what we did was we accurately weighed 10 grams of mint leaves. After doing that, we washed them with distilled water and let them dry. We minced the mint leaves and we placed them in a jar with pure alcohol. Doing that, we let the alcohol and the mint leaves submerge. We capped the jar and we put them in a dark place. We put it in a dark place so this can act as a catalyst and speed up the process. And also, <coughs> the light can have sensitivity on the extraction, so that's why we did that. This usually takes four to six weeks, but due to our short duration of time here in this program, we can only do it for two and a half weeks. So after the two and a half weeks, we filtered it with a syringe and we got mint extraction. A water treatment method. We wash the mint in tap water and then rewash it in distilled water. Then we mince and weigh 10 grams of leaves and put it in 100 microliters of distilled water. And then we boil it in 10 grams of mint and put it in 100 ml of distilled water for 20 minutes and filter and store the mint extract. So the antibacterial sensitivity assay, also known as the distiffusion method, was another method that we used. It was first used by Kirby Beer in testing, and what you do is you take a sterile disc and you place your antibiotic on the sterile disc, and you place it on a petri dish with your bacteria bacteria on it, and with that you incubate it. And when you incubate it overnight, which we did for at 37 degrees Celsius, we could see the zone of inhibition, which tells us the effectiveness on the of the antibiotic on the bacteria, and the zone of inhibition, as shown here and here. In here, the bigger it is, the more the the more sensitive the bacteria is to the antibiotic. So with that, we measure that using a ruler with millimeters. What we do is we label well for the testing of the antibacterial activity of mint leaf extraction. We label our agar plate and for our sample that we're using, then we inoculate our plates for the liquid culture that we're using to test that bacteria. Then we place the uh, testing samples onto the surface of the agar using an accepted technique. Then we incubate the place at 37 degrees Celsius overnight. And in the morning when we pull it out, we observe our zone of inhibition. These are our results that we have. These two, the Streptococcus epidermidis and the Micrococcus lucis, that's our two gram positive bacteria. But also working with us, we also had two individuals that did the same experiment with as us, but they used um, gram-negative bacteria, which is these three right here. And as you can see, compared to the water and the ethanol method, the ethanol method had more of an effect on the gram-positive, on all the bacteria actually. And the gram-positive bacteria was more sensitive to the antibiotics and the extraction method than the gram-negative bacteria. And these are the same results itself. It serves as a graphical representation of our numerical results. And these are two gram, gram negative bacteria, and these are the gram positive. I mean, the gram positive bacteria. And these are three gram negative bacteria. Our results show that the water treatment level extraction method was less sensitive, and the ethanol extraction method was more sensitive. The um, gram positive bacteria was more sensitive than the gram-negative bacteria. Due to the short duration of the time, we couldn't fully extract the mint because it takes four to six weeks and we only have four weeks in the program. But um, to further our research, we will fully extract the mint and see how we can use different extraction solvents such as chloroform and ether to extend our extraction methods. These are our references. And also, in addition to learning all of this and doing our project, we also touched on several different things. Like above, we did gram staining to tell the difference between our gram negative right here, the pinkish color, and our gram positive bacteria, which is purple. We also were touched on the MNR and the organic lab with another group. They work with MNR, so we worked with them a little. And we also did a literature view which we got research papers off the internet related to our topic and we discussed them. And surprisingly, we saw that a lot of this work is not done in the United States. It's usually done in India and Greece, et cetera.
And we would like to express gratitude to each individual that contributed to our project being such a success and those who granted us with the opportunity to participate in this excellent program that includes Dr. Angela Peters, Dean Tisdale, Mrs. Emma Colson, Ms. Ann Cherry, Dr. Harris and Dr. Panastic, the F Score Research Program, Kiana Ware and Edwin Simpson, Takia McClare, and our fellow Pierce family and Clefton community. What we've done in countries outside of America, with the two of you having done the research and looking at the results that you have gotten, would you suggest that there are ways that you can use natural uh, types of remedies as opposed to pharmaceuticals? Yeah. With the fast paced medicine that we use, even though of the slow progression, it also comes with the side effects of using the pharmaceutical medicines. The purpose of putting it through distilled water. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> with the alcohol, the ethanol, rather than with the water. The ethanol was more powerful or had a greater effect on the ground positive the bacteria. Due to, I think because we took more time to break down the, the more time with the ethanol treatment, two and a half weeks, but with the water treatment method, it was like quick and you didn't have a chance to fully extract the oils from the mint. Antibiotics. 
and it causes bloodstream infections and pneumonia in patients with cystic fibrosis. And E. coli is a diverse group of bacteria. Most strains of E. coli are harmless and is found in the healthy human intestinal tract, but it can cause illness, illnesses outside of the tract and it can be transmitted through contaminated food or water and through contact with humans or animals. And Combobacterium violaceum is a gram-negative bacillus that is an inhabitant of stagnant soil and water. And it can usually start um, in the skin and progress to swelling in the body and can cause pus. All right, so the materials and methods that we used were media preparation, the streaking method, mint extraction, and the disc diffusion essay. All right, so as they stated, we measured 10 grams of agar media. We added 10, 250 milliliters of distilled water. We mixed our ingredients and after we autoclaved it to sterilize our media. And after letting the media cool, we poured it into a petri dish so it could solidify. And we did the streaking method, as they stated. And we started in our corners. And we turned the plate 90 degrees in order to get a single colony because single colonies ensures that the bacteria is the most pure. Um, and we did two methods of mint extraction, with, which were the ethanol extraction and the distilled water extraction. And as we say it again, they, we chopped up the leaves and we submerged the mint leaves into ethanol. And we did this for two and a half weeks. And um, we put it into a dark place because light could have sensitivity effects. And we did this to speed up the process. Um, and the boiling water extraction, we put our, we chopped up our mint leaves and put it into boiling water for 200, 100 milliliters of boiling water for 20 minutes. And after letting the water cool, we filtered our mint leaf extraction. All right, and we did the antibacterial sensitivity essay, which is also known as the disc diffusion method. And in Kirby beer testing, the disc contained antibiotics that are placed into an agar plate where um, our three types of bacteria were growing. And the antibiotics that fused out onto the plate, and the areas around our disc would show how effective the antibiotics were. And these areas around here are called the zones of inhibition. And the larger the zones, the more effective it proves to be. All right, so the testing of our antibacterial activity of the mid leaf extractions we labeled the agar plates, and after doing that, we inoculated the plates with the three types of bacteria, and we placed our sample disks onto the surfaces that had um, each of our samples, and then we incubated them overnight at 37 degrees Celsius, and afterwards, we observed our plates to see if they had zones of inhibition. All right, and our results show that the water extraction had less sensitivity had less activity than the ethanol extraction. And um, in our experiments, the gram-negative bacteria had less sensitivity to the water and ethanol extraction than the gram-positive bacteria. All right, and this is just a graph, a graph showing that the um, gram-negative bacteria had less activity than the gram-positive bacteria. All right, and so again, our results show that the water extraction had less antibacterial activity than the ethanol extraction, and we found that the gram-positive bacteria had a greater antibacterial sensitivity compared to gram-negative. And because of the short duration of this program, it's supposed to be four to six weeks, but we can only do it for two and a half weeks. So if we had more time, we would do it for more. We would do the extractions for longer. And in the future, we will use other solvents like chloroform and ether and test it against other pathogenic bacteria. And these are my references. And as they stated, we did literature review and the gram stain. And I would like to acknowledge Dr. Angela Peters and Burley Tisdale for allowing us to participate. We would like to thank Azima Kalsum for her great mentoring us and for this project. And thanks to Dr. Harrison Panasic for allowing us to use their laboratories. And we'd like to thank Ms. Cherry for her assistance and our counselors, Kiana Ware, Edwin <coughs> Simpson, and Takia McClary. And thank you to EPSCOR for funding this program. And we'd like to thank each of our families and friends for their love and support. And thank you to Clapham University for allowing us to conduct research in their laboratory. My question is, uh, 
Um, and uh, we've seen your bacteria, we've seen your layers. Now, why, um, when you look at the layers of the gram positive and the gram negative bacteria, you see what has happened, right, as it relates to which one had the greater sensitivity. If you were to take that and say you use penicillin or some other type of pharmaceutical, what do you think would happen? Uh, what type of effect do you think would happen? The, the antibiotics. No, I'm, I'm talking about that. Right. Mm -hmm. What has happened is that these organisms are becoming non sensitive to the um, current day and types of antibiotics that we have. Mm -hmm. We could probably think of some of these. Less, less, of, less toxic and, uh, and also natural products that might do the same effect. Mm -hmm. We suggest uh, for other fellows coming up for you or other students that those pieces could be tested to see our difference, how they are different mm -hmm. from this piece of the one you used. Yes, yeah, other types of species because maybe they could have a greater effect on gram negative bacteria. Because as you've seen, the <coughs> gram negative bacteria didn't retain um, it as well as gram positive, so I think they should test it. In my presentation, I did I did an example did an experiment. All I had to do was look up information that could be helpful for someone else in their own um, experiment. We talked about we talked about today epigenetics, musculosis, distribute epigenetic musculosis that can be a collection and be a nice to make cell results. Epigenetics is this. The study of changing organic power modification of genes and rather than the alteration of the gene code itself. And basically sequence is a it's a it's like a change in your physical appearance rather than the genetic material and it's like a, a natural change and occurrence but can also be influenced by several factors like the age, the environment, and the disease state. And this stone modification is one part of epigenetics. And basically what it does is your DNA wraps around histone proteins and these little coils in turn gets tighter and they become nucleosome to chromatin to chromosome. chromosome. The DNA methylation is when one group, a methyl group, are added to the DNA. So basically it's getting transferred from one thing to the DNA. And microRNA dysregulation is in the normal cell, in the normal cell, the CJ island is unmethylated and the chromatin associated with active historical modifications. In the cancer cell, CTG island, hypermethylation and repressive historical marshalline and epidemic silences, the gene, this one. And actually, some um, microRNA genes are silenced through repressive historical modification rather than the DNA methylation. And multiclerosis is a long lasting disease which can affect your brain, your spinal cord, and optic nerves in your eyes. And what does it does? It causes problems with vision and balance and musculature and other basic body functions. And what it does when the immune cell it attacks a fatty material called myelin that's wrapped around the nerve fiber. And by doing that, it damages the nerve cell from sending signals to so like other parts of the body, like the muscle fiber in the body, and that will cause us problems with the movement and every other thing. And this is a graph showing how they work. The immune cell that attacks this right here, and since that happens, the nerve cell's signal is blocked or damaged, and it can't get through to the muscle fiber. And so symptoms you may have would be fatigue, numbness, or tingling in parts of your body, bladder, or bowel, bowel choke issues. And this is a chart of epigenetics and multisclerosis. So basically this is for people who want to research on it more and they can like, learn more about it. So another example, DNA manipulation. This basically does the same thing as someone. Michael, I need this regulation. So like basically, 
test that's run on different samples and it can help people in further research on um, what's sclerosis in the different parts. And so this is the raw data, so it's basically a file we found and we used it to help them in further research and what we had to do was clean it. And, we, and what um, my mentor mean by that was we take the, the information we need out of it and put it in a table that we can use and this is when they all the excess, excess um, data that we don't need. Here's an example. So we, just, we take the, um, the samples, the GDS and the organism that it's been used on, and how many samples there are for each. And these are questions to ask yourself so that you can know where, what to do, and um, I can help you. And after you finish this, uh, um, what you should have in the end when you finish all of the um, researching and gathering information. This is a reference, and I like to announce these people for letting me be a part of this program and have an opportunity to learn something about I did not know. And Dr. Mandal, Dr. Dr. Angela Peters, Dr. Brent Tidham, Chair Elska. Keanu Ware, and Eric the mentors, friends and family at Craft University. And you had to go ferret out all that data. So could you get back to one of the slides that you showed a whole lot of data before you cleaned it? All right, now this is coming, what does that mean? This, this is telling you the um, information, like the, uh, that's like the, um, the organism itself is saying. Like, what are you going to actually need in your, in your research? And like all this other uh, access on um, information, you don't really need that on um, specifics, but yeah, it can help you. Correct. So it's like one that he's going to use the rest of it just like um, data or something else, but not like a specific project. Thank you. You have mathematics, and you're the only one that did bioinformatics, and nobody else has a clue of what you did. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. If you but really know you had that. Like pay attention to what um, the mentor is telling you, and you couldn't miss anything. Because if you miss, you might miss out on something, and it could like, like, help you. And it would have been like important information you would have need. And if you would not pay attention, you would never. Excellent. Yeah. Um, and like, if they wanted to find a cure for it, for it or like make a t some type of medicine for it, they could use this information to help them in their research. Good morning, I'm Najat Noir, a rising junior at Orangeburg Wilkinson High School. I'm Alexis Gall, I'm a rising junior at Orangeburg Wilkinson High School. Good morning, I'm Crochet Davis, a rising senior at Edisto High School. The title of our project is Measuring the Effectiveness of Antibiotic Ligands on Gram-Positive and Gram-Negative Bacteria in our Administrative Student Market Security. We are basically trying to synthesize the chloral carbinyl kerosene derivative using superflex and ampicillin to fight off bacteria. And so we're trying to find the acetyl chloride based off of those properties. Okay, antibiotics are used to treat a wide range of infections caused by certain types of bacteria. And nine times out of ten, someone in here has went to the doctor and had to have an antibiotic to kill their infection. Well, antibiotic doesn't work alone to kill your infection. It is mixed with an acetyl chloride. And the acetyl chloride that we use is chlorocarbonophericine. So, and chlorocarbonophericine is priced at $300 per gram. And we're trying to replace chlorocarbonophericine with 5-bromocarbinopyridine chloride, which is placed at $132 per gram. And this is our ampicillin structure, which is a part of the penicillin class that, that treats infection by killing the bacteria that are responsible for the infection. Okay, um, ampicillin is used 
I mean, works by killing sensitive bacteria by inferring information from bacteria so uh, while it is going mainly used for urinary tract infections and chest infections. Um, penicillin is a part of a group of antibiotics that is produced naturally and usually treat skin infections, dental infections, and sexually transmitted diseases. Um, Cipoflaxin is a fluoroquinolone. Okay. Um, the difference between a regular quinolone and a fluoroquinolone is that the fluoroquinolone uses a fluorine atom, while the quinolone does not. And ciproflaxin, like any other bacteria, um, helps with chest infections and um, infections in the digestive system, so forth. And we use both gram-negative and gram-positive bacteria. Our gram-negative was Pseudomonas, or, uh, Pseudomonas arginosa um, E. coli, and our gram-positive was Staphylococcus. Epidermitis and Micrococcus ooze. And this is our five bromocarbinopyridine carbinopyridine chloride, which was needed at Clefton. And um, the reason why they call it five bromo is because it attaches to the fifth carbon. Okay, so during our experiment, we used the disc assay, which we used a petri disc, and we cultured our bacteria on it, and we put a filter paper on it, and we put our two ligands on it, and our control variable, which was methylene chloride, and we tested it to see if it created a zona inhibition. And a zona inhibition indicates the degree of sensitivity of bacteria to a drug. Okay, the shrink line, we use this to synthesize our ligands, and this knob right here, when you turn it to the right, nitrogen comes right here, and it, it condenses the liquid, and we turn it to the left for 24 hours, and the vacuum sucked out all the excess vapor. And this is our ampicillin ligand. This is our 5 bromo carbinopyridine chloride, and we mix it, we add it to ampicillin, and these are two solvents, methylene chloride, and right here is pyridine. And this is our ampicillin ligand. This is the where the bond is the bond and the petrol bond. bond and the nitrogen connected to our proteins plus HCl. Okay, so this is the molecular weight of the ampicillin complex. And as you've seen previously on the last slide, that there is the you know the figures. So the figures always have math equation to it. So over here, the 5 boronyl carbonyl is 220.05 grams per moles. The ampicillin is 349.41 grams per moles. And ampicillin ligand is 533.01 grams per moles. And hydrogen chloride is 36.45 grams per moles. And in order to find our ampicillin ligand, you have to um, add up 220.05 grams per moles plus 349.41 grams per moles subtracted with 36.45 and you get the product of the ampicillin ligand, which is 533.01. This is our ciproflexin ligand. This is the 5 bromol plus our ciproflexin and our methylene chloride and our pyridine, and this is the ciproflexin ligand plus our HCl. Again, it's the same thing, but this time it's the ciproflexin where it, is, it has a 331.35 grams per moles of molecular weight, and you exchange it from what you had, and you get 514.95 uh, grams per moles for the ciproflexin ligand. So the methods we used during our experiment, we prepared our ampicillin and ciproflexin ligand, also we used this diffusion assay. So we combined 150 milligrams of 5 bromo carbonopyridine chloride with 238 grams of ampicillin, and we also combined 150 milligrams of 5 bromo carbonopyridine chloride with 230 milligrams of ciproflexin, and we combined
combine both compounds together with the addition of methylene chloride and pyridine because the compounds can't mix until they're broken down into the simplest form and our solvents did that. And we allowed the reaction to go for 48 hours under nitrogen in a warm water bath. The reaction was then put under the sink line for two hours, which mixes our ligands together. And the MR, M, MR analysis was done before and after the reaction. And we prepared the media in the bacteria place, including our specified bacteria, and we proceeded to do this diffusion assay by using 0.5 milligrams per milliliter per disc using methylene chloride as our control. And the plates were incubated at the temperature of 25 degrees Celsius for 24 hours and stored in the refrigerator at the temperature of 7 degrees Celsius for 24 hours. And the zones of inhibition were then measured for each disc for each bacteria. Um, so as you can see, this is the results of what we were doing. Uh, over here, it is the refrigerated result, and it is 7 degrees um, Celsius, as well as over here, it is 37 degrees Fahrenheit. And these are the zone of inhibitions, where you see if it has greater effects or not. So over here is the data of our previous experiment and our current experiment. And as you can see, ampicillin had greater effect on E. coli, and Pseudonomus is the one aeruginosa has the same comparable result from superflex <coughs> and percentile yield. So in order to find our percentile yield, we have to go and find our theoretical yield. And our theoretical yield for ampicillin was 0.368, and superflexin was 0.355. And in order to find the ampicillin, so we had 0 0.110, which is our actual yield from previous experiments. And you divide it with 0.368 times um, 100, and you get 30% of that. And superflexin is like 0 0.250, and then divide it with 0.355, and then you multiply it 100, and you get 70%. And I know it's a lot of math, and there's a lot to go with it, how we found the theoretical thing, so you guys have to you guys want it, I'll do it later. <laughs> if you guys want it, it's not. Uh, so in conclusion, so we found that we better, like ampicillin is a better substitute for, for our inoxacin, which was our previous, previous um, product. So it worked better on E. coli, and we found a better comparable pro um, substitute for Ergonosa by using superflexin ligand. So, as our result showed, uh, the 5 bromocarbonyl chloride did work, but it was not as effective as we hoped for it to be. But, you know, for a cheaper product, it did have an effect, even if it wasn't strong enough. And I feel like that what we were doing. We were only doing it for like two weeks, so for that to be our, our result, it, it was pretty cool. For future works, uh, we're going to, uh, next step is to do the research fully analyze the ligands in the MMR, and also we would change up the ligands and put it on other bacteria, because there's not only just four bacteria, there's more than that. So. We would like to see if ampicillin and ciprofexin actually works on other bacteria that there is out there. And these are our references. We really appreciated the opportunity that we received to participate in this summer research <coughs> camp. The experience we have encountered in the F-score program was miraculous. We would like to thank Ms. Cherry, Mr. Curry, and Mrs. Azima. Kayla Scott, Kiana Ware, Edwin Simpson, Dr. Tisdale, and Dr. Peters. Look at the equipment that uh, NMR yes, made that you would put it on at the next step. Yes, um, these are the proteins for what we were using. So that was like different. It was complicated. Uh, what, what is that? Magnetic. Mm -hmm. So over there, you put in your compound in, and then you see if it has proteins and all those uh, 
It basically tells the chemical makeup of an organic compound. You mentioned what the sneak line does, but you never said um, what exactly you use it for in your body. We use it to simply combine them. So she So which one you found is more effective? Yes, a superfluxin ligand. And secondly, superfluxin is a group of protoplanetes which are broad spectrum. What do you mean by broad spectrum? So they're derived from an actual antibiotic. This um, experiment, and we were we had to have like you know compared to apples to apples, and that was the, yeah.